Good evening. Uh, my name is Rami Avisar. I'm the Dean of the Rosenstiel School. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 26th season of C Secret. Tonight, it's uh, our uh, fourth lecture of this uh, series. Uh, thank you all for joining. And uh, we are near the end of our 2021 lectures. And we hope you have enjoyed the series so far. All lectures this year have been online, unfortunately, but we are hopeful to be back on our campus for future uh, seasons. This season's lineup of lectures focuses on presentations from Rosenstein scientists, which underscore the four strategic initiatives that we have launched last year. These initiatives are designed to address and solve major issues facing our planet and society. So one of them was uh, Feeding the World, and that was uh, organized under the first lecture that we gave. And we know that the world uh, hunger is a massive challenge that requires sustainable, innovative solution. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United, Station, United Nations, about 110 billion more pounds of seafood will be needed by 2030 to meet the population growth and increases demand. So our scientists have made tremendous breakthroughs in marine aquaculture, which contribute directly to advancing technology and sustainable approaches to feeding the world. The second uh, initiative that we presented um, has to do with the with the saving lives, or so that's the way at least uh, that we call it. The devastations and human impact created by extreme weather events, hurricane, flooding, heat waves, and geological events like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tsunamis drives home the urgency for our scientists to, be, to build on the kind of research that protects communities and save lives. The third one is about unlocking ocean secrets. And our oceans hold vast, untapped, and unknown potential for generating fundamental scientific knowledge that can translate to major breakthroughs in multiple disciplines, including climate, weather, but also medicine. Our scientists have used that knowledge to make fundamental contribution to our understanding of cancer, among other, and cognitive and neurological disorders. The fourth initiative is about protecting our marine resources. Our school is a leader, is a leader in marine biology and ecology research and aims to accelerate efforts to protect and preserve marine ecosystems. Marine life is under increased threat from overfishing, pollution, acidification, coral bleaching, plastic accumulation, algal bloom, and to, to name just a few. We need to understand how best to balance the use of the oceans with their conservation. These initiatives are the cornerstone for philanthropic support of our school. With your philanthropic support, we can expand and accelerate the research to address the myriad of issues and provide solutions sooner. Tonight, Professor Diego Lierman and Andrew Baker will tell you about their labs and working to protect and recover depleted coral populations in Miami reefs and through the Caribbean and understand how ongoing climate change impacts these fragile ecosystems. Ultimately, their work is protecting our marine resources by generating knowledge which serves the guide and develop policies for sustainable stewardship of these resources. Professors like Learman and Baker provide highly relevant and outstanding opportunities for us to transform students into the next generation of scientists. Students benefit greatly by learning and working along side faculties such as Diego Learman and Andrew Baker. I cannot stress enough how scholarships are vital to our school missions. Scholarships allow us to recruit the best and brightest students and allow us also to reach to students who normally could not afford to attend a private university such as ours to pursue their degree 
within one of our four strategic initiatives. I hope you have been inspired by our faculty and alumni who have presented during this season C Secret and by what you will hear tonight from Professor Learman and Baker. If you have already familiar with our long history of excellence in research and academics, and you are ready to join us to fulfill our mission, I'd welcome speaking with you. There are so many ways you can help support our students and our four initiatives. Let's talk. My email will be placed in the chat box below. A special thanks uh, to our C Secret sponsor and the many friends who contribute to the Rosenstein School. C Secret sponsors include our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, the Shepard Broad Foundation, William Galway III, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, the Key Biscayne Life Enhancement Fund, and the John McCann Family Foundation. Thank you all for supporting C Secrets. It has become also a custom for us before the main speaker of the evening to introduce an alumni. And this evening, I am delighted to introduce to you Dr. Erika Toll. Erika is the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program Coordinators for NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the, uh, for the NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. She is based in uh, she's based at the NOAA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And Erika is a double alumna of the Rosenstiel School. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Science with us in 2010, and then got her PhD in Marine Biology and Fisheries in 2015. And her focus was also on the coral reef ecology and coral resilience to climate change. Erika served as the Rosenstiel School Alumni Board President from 2012 until 2015, and currently serves as the Secretary Treasurer of the Washington DC Keynes community. We are very proud of Erika and very pleased that she is with us this evening. Erika, all yours. Well, thank you again so much, Ronnie. Um, as Ronnie said, I am absolutely one of the students who benefited from Dr. Learman and Dr. Baker's guidance, expertise. Um, they were both on my PhD committee and um, I'm really grateful to them for shaping the scientist that I am today. I'm also really honored um, to be able to talk a little bit about why and how the Rosenstiel School got me to where I am. And I'll try to be brief because as you can imagine, when you do your undergraduate degree, and your doctoral degree, you spend a lot of time at Rasmus and uh, Rosenstiel is, is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'll just share a couple of reflections on why it's such an amazing program. Um, in the undergraduate program, you get hands-on field work pretty much as soon as you get started. I, I you know, for when I was putting this talk together, I went back through some old photos and, and I, determined that the first snorkel trip that you take as a freshman at Rosenstiel is literally the first week of your intro to marine science class. So um, hopefully that's case in point of how amazing it is to get um, hands-on fieldwork experience at Rosenstiel. You also have the long-term ability to do undergraduate research. I was able um, in my freshman year to start volunteering with a PhD student at the time and I worked with that student all four years of, of undergrad and was able to do a senior thesis as a result of my volunteering. And then last but certainly not least, Rosenstiel has an agreement with another amazing university uh, called James Cook University in Australia, where you can take um, reciprocal marine science classes. And I was able to study abroad there my junior year and that experience um, of being able to experience the, the Great Barrier Reef um, really made me realize that I wanted to pursue a graduate degree at Rosenstiel and, and specifically pursue coral reef ecology. So if when I when I stayed on for my graduate um, program, you know, there were so many wonderful opportunities, especially in, in the coral science field. And obviously you'll hear a lot more about that from Andrew and Diego, but things that stand out to me um, that I'll reflect on are really the, the community at Rosenstiel School. The photo in the upper right hand corner is from ICRS, which is the International Coral Reef Symposium. It's 
uh, the world's premier coral reef conference that happens once every four years. And you can see, or hopefully you can see, everybody's throwing up the U in that picture. And that's because we organized a alumni um, reunion at, during that conference. This was in 2016 in, in Hawaii. So hopefully that's a demonstration of how many people came out because Rosensteel means something to them and you know how many people are sort of in still in the coral reef circles and going to these conferences and really wanting to, to connect back with the Rosensteel community. Additionally, one of the amazing opportunities that, that Rosensteel offers is the collaboration with NOAA across the street. As Ronnie mentioned, I work for NOAA now um, and we have, a, we have an amazing opportunity with the Cooperative Institute or CMIS. And that actually um, became a really important part of where I am today, but just the opportunity to have such strong collaborations between NOAA and, and Rosensteel is, is really valuable. And lastly, the opportunities for leadership. Ronnie mentioned that because I had done my undergraduate at Rosensteel School while I was doing my, my doctorate degree, I also served um, on the board in that lower right-hand corner that's Andrew Baker and myself and some of our board members in front of um, the Rosensteel helicopter. So really got the chance in addition to doing my studies to hone my leadership skills as well. So today I am with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. I am the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program Coordinator, and we call it NCRIMP and CRMP. It's a strategic framework for conducting sustained observations across biological, climate, and social science or socioeconomic indicators. And we like to think we're fairly uh, progressive and forward thinking because we have a social science component in addition to the physical science and the biological science. And, and that's because we really believe, um, as, I, as I believe that Andrew and um, Diego would agree with, that you can't really have successful conservation unless you have an informed and engaged public. And the resulting data across all 10 US coral reef jurisdictions provide us with this robust picture of what's really happening, um, the status of coral reef ecosystems and the data is used by a variety of stakeholders. And one thing that I'm working on now or just wrapped up rather that I'm very proud of is thinking about how we get this enormous amount of data out to the public and to people that need it, um, either other um, academics, other scientists, or reef managers at local or state government levels, as well as policymakers at the highest levels of, of our government, i.e. Congress, because we collect all this data, we're sitting on a wealth of data and, and trying to understand how we provide this data at different levels. Um, like this, this diagram, I think of it as a wedding cake, but I'm really proud of something that we've just uh, worked on. In fact, a lot of uh, Rosensteel collaborators worked on this um, report, including Diego. So that's sort of a, a point of pride for me that so many people in Rosensteel were able to work on this report with me. But this is really designed at that highest level of the wedding cake. This is a highly graphic, um, plain language report that really starts to get at how how coral reefs are really doing in a way that non-scientists can understand. Um, I'll give you an example, but we tried to use lots of, like I said, lots of infographics, um, make it really easy to understand. And I think that's really important, especially when you're trying to move the needle on conservation, you have to really make sure that you're um, communicating clearly to people that there's, there's a problem. And Andrew and Diego are exceptionally good at this as well. Just a quick snapshot of um, what we've been working on. You can see the sort of infographic heavy, um, graphics and trying to sort of score using the best available data how reefs are really doing to answer that question. And, and we're actually using this report to advocate for the reauthorization of the Coral Reef Conservation Act here in Washington, DC. So I'll stop there. I'm very excited um, to hear what Andrew and Diego are going to be saying. And please feel free to connect with me. And if you want to check out the status reports, please visit www.chorus.noaa.gov slash monitoring slash status report. All of those reports um, are free and open access as are all raw and current data sets. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. It's, it's a real honor and um, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this talk. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Erica. It's a pleasure to see how your career has evolved Okay, since you were an undergrad student through the graduate school and uh, doing fantastically well. We are very, very happy uh, for you and very proud of you. So thank you for the time that you took to speak with us this evening. Really appreciate that. 
is now my pleasure to introduce you uh, tonight's uh, speakers. And uh, the I am going to introduce both of them. I'll start maybe with uh, Professor Diego Lierman. But uh, both uh, Professor Diego Lierman and Professor Andrew Baker have been colleagues and friends for many years, okay? Because they met while studying for their PhD at the Rosenstein School. So there is really a long time uh, tradition of doing research and innovation on the coral reef at the Rosenstein School. And while it is unusual for university to uh, recruit their students, uh, in that specific case, uh, there are not too many places that have the quality of the work that we do. And the top students, okay, are the one that uh, typically we are keeping uh, for ourselves. So it's not, um, uh, uh, it's really not a random choice of uh, Diego and Andrew but in fact, a very well thought strategy to continue this uh, leadership that we have been providing in uh, coral reef research. And uh, so I was indicating that Diego and Andrew met in graduate school uh, at the Rosenstiel School. And uh, they have been friends since then and their successful partnership has in fact resulted in multiple awards in restoration funding from state and federal agencies as well as a corporate and private uh, donation. Dr. Diego Lierman uh, is uh, originally from Argentina and uh, moved to the US to get uh, his uh, undergrad degree and his master's degree in California. He then received a fellowship to study at the Rosenstein in 1992 and completed his dissertation in 1997 working on the disturbance ecology of coral reefs impacted by hurricanes. Dr. Learman is now a professor at the Rosenstiel School in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology. These days, Dr. Learman splits his research time between coral reef and seagrass beds through his Benting Ecology and Reef Restoration Lab. Over the past 14 years, his research has expanded into the field of active reef restoration and he now, now runs the only reef restoration program in Miami-Dade County. His lab grows thousands of corals with underwater and land-based nurseries and has restored over 25 reefs by outplanting more than 30,000 corals. Dr. Learman is, leading, uh, is a leading expert in restoration ecology and his lab has trained a new generation of reef restoration practitioners in Miami and around the Caribbean. Five years ago, Dr. Learman established the Rosenstein School Rescue Reef Citizen Science Program that provides experiential learning and direct engagement for members of the public. The centerpiece of this program is the citizen science expeditions in which members of the public work side by side with scientists planting corals and restoring the reef of Miami. Dr. Andrew Baker is also a professor in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology at the Rosenstein School. His research focuses on coral reefs and climate change and the development and testing of interventions to increase the thermal tolerance of corals for restoration efforts. Current coral projects in Florida includes algal symbiont manipulations, stress hardening, assisted migration, migration, genetic rescue, cryopreservations, and managed breeding, with a particular focus on collaborative international partnership between the US, the Bahamas, Cuba, and Mexico for selective breeding and translocations of coral to build climate resilience across the region. He recently served on the United States National Academy of Science Committee on Interventions to increase the persistence and resilience of coral reefs. Dr. Baker previously worked for the White Life Conservation Society in New York, based at Columbia University, where he was an adjunct prop faculty. He has a bachelor degree from Cambridge University, a doctorate from the University of Miami Rosenstein School, and is a former Fulbright scholar fellow of the Explorers Club and inventor in residence at the Frost Museum of Science in Miami. 
Gentlemen, welcome, and thanks for your time for this evening. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronnie, for that introduction. And also thank you, uh, Erica, for that beautiful introduction. It really warms our hearts as educators when we get to see the kids that have gone through our labs, and they are kids when, when we get them, uh, you know, reach the top of their fields. And, and this is, Erica is a really good example of that. So thank you for that introduction. All right, so here's our working title, Restoring the Future of Coral Reefs from Colonies to Coastlines. And this is not a boast. This is actually what we are doing. We are working at, at this range of scales, going from little tiny coral polis and, pol and colonies all the way to the coastlines of Southeast Florida. So the beautiful coral reefs that we love, that we're able to see from space because of their size and structure, are actually composed, created by a community of coral colonies, coral species of very different morphologies. So we have fast growing species like you see on your left. These are the two Acropora species that we have here in the Caribbean and Florida. They grow very fast, but they fragment very easily. Right. So as I was saying, these you know, amazing, three-dimensionally complex coral reefs that you can see from space are actually created by species and colonies of different morphologies. So you have the branching corals that grow very fast on your left, and you also have the massive corals that grow very slow but are very resistant to fragmentation. So before we get into the actual research that we're doing that brings us together tonight, in restoration and, and propagation of corals, we need to spend some time describing the reason why we are doing the research that we're doing today. And this is gonna be the very depressing uh, part of the program. It's gonna be very brief. But if you were able to dive on Florida reefs about 50 years ago, more than 40% of the bottom was occupied by stony corals. When I was able to uh, do my first dive back in 1992 here in Florida, the bottom was partly occupied by stony corals at an average of 20% of the bottom occupied by corals. So we had lost more than 20% in a short 20 years. The drivers for the decline included overfishing, uh, coastal development, diseases, the uh, demise of the uh, key herbivore, the sea urchin diadema around the Caribbean, macroalgal overgrowth. So my entry into the field happen at the midpoint of the historical decline of coral abundance and diversity and distribution that we're seeing today. So when I came in, I, I was just a few weeks after Hurricane Andrew hit the, uh, the coral reefs of South Florida. After that, we had bleaching events in 1997, 1998. We had the first ever for Florida back-to-back -back bleaching years in 2014 and 2015. And then more recently, we had the outbreak of probably the worst disease epidemic we've seen on Florida's coral reefs on record. And that, all of those factors, all of those drivers combined to get us where we are today, where if you go onto an average coral reef here in Florida, if you're lucky, you will see anywhere between five and 10% of the bottom occupied by stony corals. So we have lost a tremendous amount of biomass and abundance. So that is the reason why we're focusing all of our efforts and energy into assisting the recovery of coral reefs through active coral reef restoration. So where we are today and where we go from now, from here into the future really depends on us. If we're able to globally curb carbon emissions and bring down the rate of increase in temperatures around the world, then we have a chance to see these corals recover. If we're able to work locally and regionally to limit our human driven impacts on our local communities, coral reef communities, then we will see a future for coral reefs. If we don't, then it really is um, on us that we have lost these very beautiful and important resources. So what is it that we lose when we lose our corals? We lose all of these very important ecosystem services that are provided by healthy coral reefs. You can think of your local coral reef as your hardware store or your supermarket. This is where we get protein, not only us, but billions of people around the world. This is 
the uh, these are the services that support healthy coral reefs, support jobs in fisheries, tourism, recreation, and obviously academia. This is where we get our, our building materials, our sand for our beaches. Many of our uh, pharmaceuticals, we may find in time cures for very rare diseases coming from organisms associated with coral reefs. And they also provide very important coastal protection for our shorelines. Here in South Florida, we have the most valuable and vulnerable shoreline probably anywhere in the US. So you put all of those ecosystem services together and you see a benefit to our local economies of over $500 million on a yearly basis. Globally, over $2 billion are provided to the local economies and the global economies by healthy coral reefs. So that is what we lose when we lose coral reefs. So what are we doing, you ask? And that's a really good question because we are spending the bulk of our, of our energy trying to mitigate impacts and recover coral reefs. So the most recent development is the, uh, the, the award that we have in place granted by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well as NOAA that brings together the state of the science in coral reef restoration, brings together partners that have dedicated the past 10 or 15 years of their academic careers to develop the best practices, the best science for ecosystem restoration. So that includes different departments and different schools within the University of Miami, our partners to the north, NOVA Southeastern University, Frost Museum of Science, Seacor International, and the Florida Aquarium. Again, with funding from NIFWIF and NOAA, as well as local and regional partners, we came together to create the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Restoration Hub. That is an innovation and restoration hub that brings all of our expertise together into a single into a single program with the single goal of mitigating impacts on our coral reefs and restoring our coral reefs. So this program, the Restoration Hub, is based on four key pillars. One, restoration, two, adaptation, three, coastal resilience, and four, education. And we'll touch upon all of these components of our Restoration Hub in this discussion tonight. So what happens when you lose corals? In coral reefs, structure and function go hand in hand. When you lose the corals, eventually through bioerosion and physical damage, you will lose the structure. And when you lose the structure, you lose the protection that healthy coral reefs provide to our shorelines. Several studies over the past five years have shown very clearly that healthy coral reefs, shallow coral reefs, complex coral reefs close to shore can mitigate more than 90% of the impact of incoming waves. They can take away more than 90% of the energy and the height of incoming waves. And that is huge in terms of coastal protection. In fact, recent studies have shown that healthy coral reefs provide coastal protection to South Florida at the tune of $675 million on a yearly basis. And that gets amplified when you have severe storms like we just had four years ago hit our coastal environment. So we need healthy reefs to be able to protect our shorelines. And we have shown through our experiments that by adding healthy corals onto reef structure or artificial structures for that matter, you get an additional 50% 15% wave mitigation. So we need to have thriving, healthy coral reefs that are very complex, that are very shallow and near shore to be able to mitigate the impacts of incoming waves. So this is the work that we are doing in collaboration with the Sustain Lab here at the University of Miami run by Dr. Brian House, as well as Landolf Road Barbarigos from the School of Engineering. We're trying to design intelligent next generation artificial structures that combine gray infrastructure, namely cement, with the corals that we grow within our nurseries to be able to, again, mitigate the impacts of incoming waves. So this is just a brief video that shows you how having a healthy coral reef represented by the structure on the top of the uh, movie with corals attached to them, you can see the waves breaking on top of that structure. And right below it, you can see the waves going straight through. So whenever you don't have structure, covered by healthy corals, then you don't have the wave mitigation capability. So this is what we're trying to hope to achieve, to mitigate the impacts of, of waves through coral reef restoration. 
The approach that my lab has taken is to develop the coral gardening methodology and apply it to South Florida reefs. We collect small pieces from wild colonies because we don't have a lot of corals left. And then we grow these small pieces into large stocks within our in-water or land-based coral nurseries. So we're able to go from a few coral fragments to thousands of them over a short period of a couple of years. And then once we've increased our stocks to the point where we don't need to collect any more wild corals, then we can go out and plant these corals in large numbers onto our depleted reefs in the hopes that we will give these communities a push in the right direction. So eventually they will recover by themselves. So this is just an example of the different methodologies and strategies that we use to grow our corals within our nurseries. You can see that we grow them on blocks, we can grow them on frames, we can grow them on trees, as well as grow them on our <coughs> large facility for land-based propagation that we have here at the University of Miami. And what we've done so far is really amazing. We now have three coral nurseries running from Key Biscayne all the way to North Key Largo. We grow seven coral species within our nurseries. We house more than 200 different genotypes. We have worked at more than 60 restoration sites and we have planted thousands and thousands of corals. We actually plant more than 10,000 corals on a yearly basis. So we are really making an impact on the uh, health of the uh, depleted coral populations. And this works. You can see the image on your left. It's a small coral fragment. And two years later, the same fragment has grown into a basketball size coral colony. So again, this really, really works at large scales. And we're now expanding the, uh, the number of species that we are using within our restoration framework. framework. So we are having a large scale impact benefit to our coral reefs. And this was very evident last year when we were able to see document for the first time the sexual reproduction the spawning of corals grown within our nurseries so this was from last year and you can see in this video the gamete bundles that are released by nursery grown corals within an outplanted restored coral reefs these are coral babies that we were able to grow with the help of seacor international into larvae and then we were then able to plant these coral babies back onto our depleted reefs, increasing the abundance of corals, as well as the genetic diversity of our restored coral population. So this was a huge milestone that we were able to achieve even within our uh, COVID year. We were able to see and document our coral corals grown within nurseries spawn and contribute to their own recovery. So uh, Ronnie mentioned the Rescue Reef Program. This is another a uh, source of, of pride for me personally, because we were able to put together within a very short amount of time, five years, a growing, expanding citizen science program where people from the public, people like you listening to our presentation today, you can come and join us and help us restore our coral reefs. So if you're interested in doing this work, not just listening about it and learning about it, but actually doing this work, please reach out to us and we will gladly take you out in one of our restoration expeditions. So that together we're able to turn a reef that used to look like this into a reef that now looks like this. So let me show you briefly what these expeditions look like. All of our expeditions start from Key Biscayne. You get a lecture from one of our experts. You get to visit our nurseries where you see thousands and thousands of corals, in this case grown on propagation trees, you get to help us clean the structures, and then you get to collect the corals that you will then take to a restoration reef or restoration site and actually plant. So this is the work that we do on a year, on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. And you're able to actually do this work alongside experts from our labs. So we collect these coral fragments, put them into baskets, and then take them back onto the abode where we will then work to create these coral cookies that bring together several fragments into a common base. And then our divers take these coral cookies down to the ocean floor where they are planted using cement, which is a method that we developed in our lab to be able to expand, increase the number of corals that we can plant 
and you basically position the coral cookies in this case fragmented fragments of stack horn coral as well as fragments of massive coral species and this is the work that we do every week to be able to plant thousands of corals onto our depleted reefs so again come join us and be part of the uh, solution be part of the restoration of our beloved coral reefs so in summary reef restoration works but we haven't really tackled the big issues that are that caused the uh, declines in the first place so the corals once planted face the same challenges that the corals that declined over the past 50 years faced so this is the work the very important work that andrew baker is doing in his lab and he will be able to describe the climate adaptation strategies that we now have so that we're not just growing corals and planting the next wave of, of climate victims that we're actually planting corals in such a way that will maximize their survivorship for the long term so i'm going to turn it over to andrew and i'll stick around if you guys have any questions thank you for your time great um, thanks so much, Diego, and um, thanks, Ronnie, and thanks, Erica, for the for the introductions. Um, I have to say it's great to be able to talk to you all tonight. It's great to work on a project with someone that I count very much as a, as a friend as well as a colleague. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Diego left off and talk about the remaining challenges that face reefs, which are many. Um, as some of you will no doubt know, coral reefs are intensively threatened by climate change and coral bleaching, which is the process by which corals turn white and lose these symbiotic algae that, can, that are contained within their, uh, their tissues, uh, is a real problem, not just in Florida, um, but also worldwide. And uh, many of you will have seen headlines, local newspaper articles um, that have uh, recorded, commented, highlighted on these waves of bleaching and also disease that Diego also mentioned that have been devastating our reefs locally. And this is not just in Florida, as I mentioned, it's also worldwide. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef recently lost over the last uh, few years, perhaps as much as 50% of its shallow water corals due to climate change related bleaching activities. And so as Diego mentioned, the challenge is, how do we make our reefs more climate resilient? How do we pre-adapt them? How do we prepare them for a future that is looking increasingly uh, warm for them? Uh, are there methods that we can use to help increase our chances of success and make sure that our, our children, our, our grandchildren still have reef, reefs in a future world. And this question uh, has actually been uh, posed by a number of scientists recently. The US National Academy of Sciences recently convened a committee of experts to sort of look at all of the different mechanisms, all of the different tools, technologies that could be applied to help save reefs in the 21st century and produce this sort of report looking and summarizing at all of those different types of uh, methods. And, they, and I was lucky enough to be part of this committee and had a chance to review all of these methods. And we, we sort of divided them into uh, different categories. And, and I'm going to actually run through a few of these ideas uh, now. We divided them into genetic and reproductive interventions, population and community interventions, physiological interventions, and environmental interventions. And to give you an example of what those really translate to uh, within the genetic and reproductive interventions, what we're talking about here are things like managed selection, which is identifying coral genotypes, uh, genetic, genetically distinct coral individuals that for whatever reason are sort of tougher or more climate tolerant and selectively propagating them in our nurseries. Uh, it includes things like managed breeding, which is trying to identify uh, coral mums and dads who are more thermally resilient or more disease tolerant and actually selectively breeding them to produce offspring that contain those genes for those particular qualities in the sort of next generation. And as part of uh, those sort of managed breeding efforts, uh, developing technologies that help us capture uh, gametes and coral larvae in the field, uh, potentially also cryopreserve them, um, freeze them for later use so that we can be more effective in the way that we selectively breed these corals, and even uh, genetically manipulate corals. There are methods and technologies out there, uh, such as CRISPR, that actually allow us for the first time to uh, look at things like gene editing. And so we reviewed all of these different methods as part of that report. 
Uh, then within the physiological interventions, there's also a number of other activities that we can do. Uh, we can pre-expose corals to warmer conditions and sort of stress harden or toughen them up uh, to help them deal with uh, more stressful conditions, more warmer oceans. We can manipulate the algal symbionts that are hosted inside of these corals. As I mentioned, when corals bleach, they actually dump these symbiotic algae. And it turns out that these algae are the sort of the, the thermally sensitive link in the chain. So if we can introduce corals to algae that are perhaps a little bit more thermally tolerant, they have a better chance of surviving uh, bleaching. We can uh, do a whole bunch of other things. We can manipulate the, the microbiome of these corals, the bacterial and other components that make up the, the, these coral individuals. We can look at antibiotics. We can look at phage therapy, antioxidants, and even nutritional supplements to help them survive, um, to survive in the bleached state. And then we can also uh, think about moving corals around in these population and community interventions. We can potentially identify corals that live in warmer areas and move them to areas that are just a little bit cooler, but which are expected to warm so that we're actually uh, relocating corals in anticipation of climate change. And then finally, there's a whole suite of environmental interventions that were also proposed. And these include modifications, not to the corals themselves, but to actually try to manipulate the environment and the environmental triggers that cause coral bleaching. And, uh, you know, examples of this include, for example, in Australia, marine cloud brightening, which is actually um, uh, trying to encourage the, the formation of clouds offshore that actually reduce uh, the amount of solar irradiance on reefs and reduce the warming effect from sunlight and uh, to actually uh, you know manipulate those conditions through these sort of geoengineering methods and so you can see here that you know there's really a whole bunch of different methods that are on the table and so the question for us here in miami is which of these methods um could we could we try which of which of these methods are suitable and my answer to that question has been well as many as we can um, you know, the, 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 the things that I'm going to circle now in red are the things that we're actually trying at the Rosensteel School. We're doing some managed selection, identifying genotypes of corals that are thermally tolerant. We're actually beginning uh, the first ever managed breeding program where we're trying to uh, crossbreed uh, elkhorn corals from the Bahamas with those from Florida as a way of introducing new genetic stock into the declining diversity of those elkhorn populations. As part of this, we're working with partners to capture gametes, coral eggs and sperm from the wild to help with those efforts and also cryopreserve them by freezing sperm in uh, liquid nitrogen. We're looking into stress hardening methods to try to pre-adapt our corals and we're manipulating algal symbionts. Um, so many of these methods we are attempting here in Miami um, and really the goal here is recognizing that um, we don't have much time. Um, we, uh, we are in a, a climate crisis and uh, the, tie, the, the, the solution uh, is really to try as many different things as we can, uh, figure out which techniques work as quickly as possible. And for those methods that don't work to move on as quickly as possible to the next. So it's very much a kind of a, a fast fail approach. And uh, here in Miami, obviously our location means that we're particularly well suited to do this. We have labs uh, and uh, ex situ facilities, sort of tanks on land where we can maintain coral populations uh, that are all within 15 minutes or so of local reefs. So it really gives us a great opportunity to try to apply some of these really 21st century methods to investigate which one of them is a, a likely to have the best chance of success. And it's hard to predict ahead of time, right? What works in one area might not work in another. So it's very context specific. And at the same time, we have to keep an, an eye on the fact that we can't really engineer our way out of this crisis. None of this is a substitute for what we also need to be doing at the same time, which is you know, controlling our carbon emissions or finding other ways to solve the climate crisis and also continuing to manage reefs for the future, making sure that we're not doing uh, activities on reefs that would harm them, um, you know, keeping an eye on water quality, keeping an eye on habitat destruction, um, and, uh, you know, in general, managing them to be as healthy as possible so they really have a fighting chance of success. And this is, you know, not new for us. Um, it turns out that Rosensteel School was actually founded uh, by a coral reef biologist. We were founded in 1943 by F.G. Walton Smith, who was a British naval officer who founded the school, and he actually wrote a book on Atlantic reef corals in 1948. So we have this sort of rich 
history of coral biology um, that really reflects obviously our, our history and geography. Um, and you know that uh, history is now sort of being taken forward into the 21st century. Uh, as I mentioned, here is a, a few slides just showing the kinds of activities that we're doing. Um, this is um, uh, essentially a sort of a, a, a stress test for corals where we're trying to rapidly and reliably uh, identify which coral uh, genotypes, which coral individuals are the toughest. We can rank them and we can sort of uh, then use these individuals for selective propagation or potentially for selective breeding. So this is using new technology that we are working on in collaboration with scientists at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Uh, we're also working with other partners at the Florida Aquarium who really pioneered the use of uh, laboratory induced coral spawning. These are putting corals in tanks and sort of fooling them uh, into spawning at the right times of the year. And this obviously makes it a lot easier to collect their eggs and sperm and to fertilize them um, and to selectively breed for qualities of interest. And uh, the tank you see on the left is the, the Florida Aquarium setup that they have for endangered pillar corals. And you can see them actually spawning in the tank. And we're in the process of constructing three tanks like the one you see on the right uh, to essentially do this as part of our efforts with endangered uh, elkhorn corals. At the same time, I mentioned uh, uh, coral uh, cryopreservation. Um, we had a chance to learn from the experts. This is a grad student in my lab who was working with another pioneer in this field who's at the Smithsonian based out of Hawaii, learning how to freeze uh, coral sperms for later use so that we can really build up sort of a gene bank of corals and the more uh, the greater the diversity that we accumulate, the better chances we have of, of breeding for uh, particular qualities. And then some research that we've been doing in my lab for many years uh, really looks at these algal symbionts inside corals and realizing that we have the ability to manipulate those symbionts, especially at the early stage in a coral's life where it doesn't have any uh, algae to begin with and we can sort of selectively introduce them to heat tolerant types. And what we're discovering is that not only do those algae make the baby corals more heat tolerant and they can potentially retain those into their adult stages as well. Uh, but we've now also recently discovered that some of these symbionts seem to also um, impart some degree of disease resistance to their corals hosts as well. And so this is a really exciting area of research. And it's only really by bringing together these methods with the restoration techniques that you just heard about from Diego, do we have a chance of scaling up these activities to really make them um, something that could address the crisis that we face. And so part of that obviously involves infrastructure. And so we've worked really hard over the last few years in developing the land-based propagation facilities that you can see here. Um, there's, these are large shade houses uh, containing, in some cases, really large uh, f uh, open systems that we've uh, used to hold, for example, spawning corals, as well as what you can see here on the left, which are uh, these are micro fragments. These are pieces of corals that we've generated from individual colonies. And these tiles of corals can now be outplanted on the reef. And you saw a few, uh, some footage of Diego's lab doing that. And what's next is we really want to keep expanding this further. We've just built another shade house that you can see here. This is sort of breaking ground on it. And the idea is to fill this with the tanks like, the, like those you can see on the left to really expand our capacity to scale up to meet the challenge. And so that's a scaling up, not just of uh, the built infrastructure that you see here, but also in the personnel, in the, in the, the people infrastructure that we need to uh, be working in the field and in the lab uh, to push this, uh, this field forward. And so this is all about science really in the service of restoration, realizing that we have a crisis on our hands, but that you know, we do have some degree of control here and trying to leverage the tools of 21st century science into improving the futures for these corals. So what can you do? Um, well, just the fact that you're here learning about this stuff from Diego and I um, uh, indicates that you know, you're um, pre-selected here. You're probably doing many of the activities that uh, we've included on this slide, uh, but go ahead and please share this knowledge and share with people the fact that um, efforts are being made and there are people out there that are pretty passionate about uh, restoring these reefs. Um, support local governments uh, efforts to uh, try to improve these uh, futures and to protect the reefs that we have left. And obviously uh, help us, support us. Um, 
you can donate to the Rosenseal School. And so you can metaphorically dive in and join us, but you can also, as Diego mentioned, literally dive in and join us. And Diego's Rescue or Reef Citizen Alliance program is a really great example of that. Um, so with that, I, I'm just gonna wrap it up. Um, I, I want on behalf of Diego and myself, we wanna thank all of the folks that have been in our labs over the years. There's some contact information here and you can follow us on various social media outposts. I also really want to um, thank uh, all of the uh, collaborative institutions and partners that we've worked with over the last few years to form uh, the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Restoration Hub. And you can see we're a network of six uh, local South Florida institutions that are all working together, sharing our resources, sharing our expertise, and rather than competing for funding, collaborating to get that funding so that we uh, have the best possible outcome. And on the topic of funding, we, we want to really also um, thank all of the various sponsors and uh, partners that have funded these efforts so far. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back over to Ronnie and say once again, thank you to everyone for attending. Wow, thank you guys. That was amazing. You know, great presentation. We really, really appreciate uh, your effort uh, that you are doing and, um, you know, and certainly the time also that you took this evening uh, to speak with our community. So um, uh, for those of you indeed interested to uh, participate in the effort of, uh, of uh, Diego and, and uh, Andrew, uh, so they have provided to you the direct way of contacting them. You can also contacting us directly at the school. And uh, we will uh, make sure that uh, your support goes to the right place if that's, um, if that's uh, your, uh, your interest, uh, both in terms of the students as well as the research that, uh, that they do. Uh, I would like to encourage you also to come to our last uh, presentation for this year, which will be held on uh, Tuesday, April 13, and it will be given by uh, Daria Akena, uh, who is a mechanical engineer at the oceanographer uh, and an oceanographer at uh, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. And uh, she will uh, present uh, uh, on uh, the title of her presentation is going to be why are there colors in the ocean? So that promises to be also a very interesting lecture. And I believe that the specific for her lecture and the part of how to participate is going to be provided in the chat of the Q&A box, sorry. And uh, with that, we are going to uh, give the leftover time, which is uh, very limited to uh, questions that you might have uh, for Andrew and uh, Diego. Again, thank you very much. Have a great evening. And uh, let's end it with uh, questions to uh, Diego and, um, and Andrew. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Ronnie. I've been typing as fast as I could as Andrew was speaking. So uh, I, I think I've addressed a, a good number of them. But you, know, you should reach out to us individually in terms of internships and opportunities in our lab. Um, so you know you'll have your our, our contacts available or you can go online and, and look us up so for any any sort of information about opportunities within our labs so a question here that uh, from laura when you're growing corals in these gardens to uh you keep the native symbionts and could it be possible to increase the resilience of corals even more by enhancing their algal symbionts it it, it is certainly something that you can do and I, I sort of alluded to this in my remarks which is that by changing the identity of the algal symbionts, we can actually change the physiological properties of, their, of the coral host. So corals that host heat resistant uh, symbionts uh, do actually increase their bleaching thresholds by a degree or even two degrees centigrade. So if you can figure out a way to, to encourage or promote the growth of certain algal types as symbionts over others, then that gives you this automatic increase in thermal tolerance. And that's exactly what we've been doing. We've, we've done it with adult corals, um, but actually for various reasons, we think it's gonna be much more scalable with baby corals where you have the chance to operate with thousands or even tens of thousands of, of corals in one go. Um, we also are sensitive to the idea, the idea that there could be trade-offs to this, right? We, we also need to monitor what else happens. Maybe they're more thermally tolerant, but perhaps they grow more slowly. And so it's tough because managers and scientists have to make this decision. What are the qualities that we really want um, most? And so there's a whole decision-making process that has to go into that too. 
Crystal is asking to be updated on the local government efforts on coral reef restoration. Is there a specific source you would recommend checking out a website or a journal? Yeah, for our area, um, the um, South Florida Coral Reef Initiative brings together managers and researchers that, that focus on, on the uh, coral reefs outside the Florida Keys. So Miami-Dade, Broward, and North. And uh, so their website is always a good uh, resource in terms of reports and, and papers and educational materials, even for, for schools. So definitely visit the, um, the Seth Cree um, website. Uh, we, can, we can share those, those links. Uh, to you. The state has is, is become a really big player in terms of uh, funding uh, coral reef restoration. Uh, initially, they, they, um, they gave out a lot of funding for uh, disease work, and now they're expanding onto, onto actual active restoration. And uh, other sources of funding for us have been NOAA over the, over the years as well as other you know, uh, local and, and federal agencies. But the state is now playing an increasing role in funding and supporting coral reef restoration, which is, which is great for us. So quick question about the materials being used, uh, previously zip ties versus cements. Is there a, uh, the differences between the two and what, what got you all into using cement for fixing the corals to the, to the reef? Or the uh, the bottleneck that we have, and uh, even though we've been doing this for 15 years, and we're still planting every single coral by hand, so we're able to grow thousands of corals. But then we have to plant these corals, so it's becoming an increasing bottleneck in terms of the manpower that it takes. So we're always looking for methods to enhance our our you know efficiency when we are diving, and uh, by switching from individually uh, using one nail, one cable tie per coral to using cement to, um, to create bases where we plant multiple corals on the same base. We've gone from planting maybe 20 corals per diver per dive to planting close to 50 to 75 corals per diver per dive. So cement has given us the opportunity to expand the, uh, you know, the number of corals, increase the number of corals that we can plant on a given day. It's been great. So we are almost out of time. One last question. Most of the remarks that are coming in here are congratulations to both of you for a great presentation. Many are saying it's a wonderful talk. Um, last but not least, what advice would you give to students who want to become or get into coral restoration, coral research? What advice do you have? Well, I would say, you know, Diego and I sort of got into it by different routes. Um, Diego got into restoration very much um, as, as a graduate student, as part of one of the topics that he that he began. And I came to it sort of later in my career through sort of a different a different route. But what we both had in common is, you know, we had a passion for biology. We, you know, we stayed in school. We, we, we followed our, our passions and, and interests and you know, one thing led to another, and we went on to graduate school and and followed our our hearts, I suppose. Yeah, just to add to that, even though when you when you look at the work that we do, it entails a lot of, uh, you know, handiwork and cutting and, and and pasting and and you know and gluing things. There's a very strong scientific background. So to second what Andrew say, you know, said you know it's a STEM discipline. So you need to know your basics. You know, you you don't just want to you know start by planting corals. You want to learn about coral biology, coral physiology, coral genetics, coral reef ecology, uh, to have a strong scientific background so you can further the, um, the field into the future. Yeah, I think as you can see from our two talks, the, uh, there's, you know, there's many different disciplines that are all feeding into this, uh, including the sort of the ecological basis of coral health, but also as Diego mentions, you know, genetics work and genetic man manipulations, physiological experimentation, um, so the you know core science uh, disciplines of biology and genetics are, are, are really important, and I think is partly contributed to why there's been an explosion in restoration interest in the last five years because these it's starting to be recognized that these core disciplines can really help impact some of these restoration outcomes. And the last thing that I want to mention is coral reef restoration has been great a great vehicle to uh, to share the uh, you know the story about coral reef decline and recovery. So you know coral folks that come on our trips that are able to you know break corals and plant corals they're hooked they you know the hands-on experiential learning cannot be you know underestimated it you know really you know takes takes doing to to love something and uh so again join join the fight uh you know however you can whether you are you know in a landlocked state somewhere 
uh, you know, learn about coral reefs and share uh, their importance and their beauty. And uh, if you're, you know, locally uh, available to come out with us, come join us, come see our labs. You know, whenever we open up again, you know, we have lab tours all the time. So you get to see, you know, where we, um, where the magic happens. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for a great presentation. Uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Learman, they, this presentation, for those of you that are asking, all of this information will be made available on our YouTube channel. You can follow us at UMiami Rasmus, R-S-M-A-S, on YouTube. Uh, this will also be posted to Facebook, and you'll get a follow-up email uh, with the links to the lecture as well. Join us on April 13th for our final Sea Secrets of the Season, and thank you both very, very much. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for attending. Bye. Be safe.